Dr. Kirk Durston is who we'll be hearing from today on Does God Exist? He's got four degrees, which I have to read because I will not remember them. Um, he has a BSc in Physics as well as a BSc in Mechanical Engineering. He has an MA in Philosophy as well as a PhD in Biophysics. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Kirk Durston. <laughs> So let's begin with the origin of the universe and the existence of God. About two years ago, there was a interesting article in New Scientist, and they looked at the various theories for the origin of the universe. One theory is that this universe is a one-shot deal. Uh, there's another set of theories or category of theories that look at the possibility that this universe is, is undergoing uh, alternate expansions and contractions and, and with the hope that this has gone on forever. In other words, that this universe is, is a perpetual motion machine. The third category of theories is probably one of the more popular ones right now, and that's the category of the multiverse theories. But the bottom line is that the universe did in fact have a beginning regardless of which category of theories that you go for. That has implications. And Stephen Hawking is quoted in that article as stating, a point of creation would be a place where science broke down. One would have to appeal to religion and the hand of God. My understanding is that Stephen Hawking is not a theist. I think he's an atheist, at least an agnostic. Why would Hawking say something like that, though? What I want to do here is present now an argument uh, why Hawking would have to say or come to such a conclusion. Before I do that, I want to explain one thing in logic, or one logical mistake that sometimes people make, and that's called the circular fallacy. That assumes your conclusion is true in the opening premise, and then once you've assumed that's true in your opening premise, you therefore reason from that to conclude that uh, your conclusion is true. But the problem, of course, is, is that you assume the conclusion was true in your opening premise. Now let me give you an example here of a circular argument. His first proposition, he would say, was, well, the Maple Leafs will win the Stanley Cup, and since they will win the Stanley Cup, they must be the best hockey team out there. Now, since they are the best hockey team, as we've just seen, they will win the Stanley Cup. Therefore, the Maple Leafs will win the Stanley Cup. Now, the problem with a circular argument is that they've assumed, they were trying to prove that the Maple Leafs would win the Stanley Cup, but they assumed that the truth of their conclusion in their opening premise, and that's called a circular argument. That's just one example of a circular argument. But that has implications for the origin of nature. You cannot assume the existence of natural processes to explain how natural processes came into existence. To clarify, we cannot provide a natural explanation for the origin of nature without assuming the existence of nature in your natural explanation. By now, some of you will probably begin to understand why Hawking said that. Science breaks down at the moment of creation. So logic requires that the cause of nature must be something else. In other words, it must not be in that category that we call natural. It has to be in another category, and we'll call that other category not natural. Essentially, you have two boxes. You have the box where <clears throat> everything that is governed by space, time, matter, and energy and the laws of physics is in that box, regardless of how many different laws of physics there are, and how many universes, and so forth. And in the other box, you have everything else. And we'll call everything else the things that are not natural. But all we're saying now is that we have a box over here that's not natural, or we have a word for that, the supernatural box. So it's either one of the two categories. It's a true dichotomy. In other words, there's no other box. It's either natural or it's not natural, one of those two options. Now, here's the argument. The cause of nature must be either natural or not natural. The cause of nature cannot be natural, as we have just seen. That would be a circular fallacy. Therefore, the cause of nature must be supernatural. This is cold, hard logic at work. In order to avoid the circular fallacy, you cannot assume the existence of natural processes in order to come up with a natural explanation for the origin of natural processes. Simple as that. Now, there's a number of objections can be raised for this, and I want to look at several of them. Could it be something that we've not yet discovered or something so bizarre or so different that we do not yet understand it? Could it be something like that? Well, possibly. Logic tells us that it's going to be logically impossible for whatever that thing is to be natural. That's the one thing 
we do know about the cause of the universe or the cause of nature itself. Another objection. If logic entails that science cannot provide an explanation, then should not science trump logic? I've run into this quite often because people are so utterly convinced that science explains everything that if logic and science start to butt heads, logic must stand aside for science. Science trumps logic. I would argue that logic is fundamental to at least two things, mathematics and nature itself. There are principles of logic that are involved uh, in mathematics, for example, the law of non-contradiction. Logic also seems to be woven into nature itself. Again, we see the principle of non-contradiction and cause and effect in nature itself. There are two, at least two, pillars upon which science is based. One is math, one is nature, and both pillars themselves stand on the foundation of logic. Science does not trump logic, science is dependent upon logic. And if you toss, science, toss logic, you just toss science. You cannot do science without uh, observing the principles of logic. For example, the principle of falsification assumes the logical principle of non-contradiction. So if you have a theory that predicts such and such, you do your test and it turns out that what it predicted was falsified by the test that the general assumption is, is that your theory is wrong. It needs to go back to the drawing board. Another objection, number three, is that the universe came from nothing. Nothing caused the universe. And this has been popularized by physicist Lawrence Krauss. But it's a misleading use of the word nothing. In Krauss's theory, you don't really require any, any energy at all for the origin of the universe, nor do you require any mass. But you do need some sort of law of quantum gravity operating in another space-time continuum in order for this to occur. In other words, the laws of quantum mechanics will not work without some sort of nature within which to work. So it really just pushes the problem back one notch. That brings up the fourth objection. Given that logic entails that the origin of nature must be not natural or supernatural, then what was the cause of that supernatural cause? This does not falsify the argument that I presented, that logical syllogism right at the beginning. That argument stands, but it raises this question. Well, the cause of physical time, which itself has a beginning, it must be either dependent upon time or be timeless. Now that's important because it's logically impossible for the cause of physical time to be dependent upon physical time in order to avoid the circular fallacy. In other words, whatever it was that caused nature to come into existence must be able, at least at that point, to exist independent of time itself. Therefore, the cause of time was timeless, at least logically prior to, and we're talking logically prior, not temporally prior, logically prior to the point of creation of physical time and nature itself. It is logically impossible to cause a timeless entity to come into existence. It's either always there or never there. In other words, no temporal regress is possible for whatever it was that caused time to come into existence. The regress actually has an ending and it ends there. Roger Penrose, a colleague of Stephen Hawking, states that the accuracy of the creator's aim would have to have been one part in 10 raised to the 10 raised to the 123rd power to get a universe capable of supporting life. The idea here is that if you have a purpose involved in the origin of nature, that suggests that the cause is not only supernatural, not only the end of any temporal regress, but it also has a mind, a mind capable of having a purpose and designing the universe accordingly. So, what do we logically conclude from the origin of nature? Number one, the origin of nature is supernatural and uncaused. Number two, it is therefore logically impossible for science to explain everything, at least the origin of nature itself. Science will never, ever explain the origin of nature because science is dependent upon the existence of natural processes to come up with a natural explanation. But we cannot assume the existence of natural processes to explain the origin of natural processes and therefore that's why Hawking said that if, the, if there is a creation event for the universe, then science breaks down, simply because science has nothing to say about the origin of nature. Once you get nature up and running, of course, then you've got natural processes, and you can combine that with logic and the, and the laws of physics and so forth and mathematics, and then you can do science. 
Since the supernatural is the origin of nature, it is also indirectly the foundation of science itself. So let's go now to the uh, second argument I want to cover, and that is the argument from history that God exists. So here's a question we could ask. Has God ever appeared in history in the form of a human being and walked among us? Well, there are many people who have claimed to be God. I met uh, one at UBC, by the way, about back in the 80s. Numerous ancient prophecies extending back thousands of years spoke of the coming of a Messiah or Christ who would come from eternity, be born as a human, satisfy the demands of flawless justice, and then rise from the dead. And I want to argue here that Jesus of Nazareth appears to have fulfilled those claims. So let's take a look at the form of my argument from history. Again, it's a syllogism with three statements. The first proposition is that Jesus claimed to be I am. And I am was the name in, in that culture for God, the creator of the universe. God had appeared to Moses a long time earlier and he says, this will be my name for all generations. Interesting name, by the way, because it does fit with this idea of a mind that was independent of time that brought nature into existence. I am, no past, no future, just the present. So when he claimed he was I am, there was a very clear uh, understanding in that culture exactly who he was claiming to be. Proposition number two is the controversial one, and it states that there is extraordinary warrant for taking his claim seriously. And if that's true, then it logically entails proposition number three. There is extraordinary warrant for believing that God exists, is active in history, and has appeared among us. There are certain what are, what are referred to as historical bedrock facts about Jesus of Nazareth that are unanimously or nearly unanimously granted by the scholars in the field. And uh, when we look at the people of the field, Lacona points out this includes atheists, agnostics, Jews, Christians, and Christians at both ends of the theological spectrum and everywhere in between, the majority would not be of any particular religious belief. This is what I mean and what Lacona means when he's referring to historical bedrock facts. So what are they? The consensus of the scholars in the field is that Jesus performed feats that both he and his followers interpreted as miracles and exorcisms. Now keep in mind that a lot of the scholars would not grant that they actually were miracles and exorcisms. They're saying they were interpreted as such, okay? He, he did do things that the people of the day thought were miracles, according to the reports that are written and that are passed down to this day. Uh, people who were blind from birth, who were given the ability to see within one to two seconds. People who couldn't walk were given the ability to walk, completely healed within, you know, basically a few seconds. Those were the kind of miracles that they reported. So the, the historians in the field agree that he did appear to do these things. The evidence is just substantive enough, uh, which the people of the day interpreted, at least as followers, the, as miracles and exorcisms. Number two, uh, with regard to the historical bedrock facts, Jesus viewed himself as God's agent through whom the kingdom of God was coming. Basically, he was the Messiah. It was an entirely different kind of kingdom within this world, and he was bringing that in. Uh, the third historical bedrock fact granted by the scholars in the field is that Jesus died of crucifixion. Again, you have reports by uh, Cornelius Tacitus and so forth that this appeared to have happened. The fourth historical bedrock fact granted by the scholars in the field is that very shortly after Jesus' death, the disciples had experiences that led them to believe and proclaim that Jesus had been resurrected and had appeared to them. And so they're not saying that Jesus actually rose from the dead. What they are saying is that very shortly after his death by crucifixion, his disciples, his followers, had experiences, unusual experiences, and they interpreted, or those experiences led them to believe that he'd risen from the dead. Now that establishes that the idea that Jesus rose from the dead was not something that came along 300 years later, but was right in the first century, uh, almost immediately after the crucifixion. And within a few years of Jesus' death, Paul converted after experiencing what he appeared as a post-resurrection appearance of Jesus to him. Thousands and thousands of people believed he'd risen from the dead in the middle of a city that was the heart of, of um, 
Pharisaical Judaism, the kind of Judaism that was followed by the Pharisees. Uh, and Paul was one of them, but then he claims to have seen Jesus and radically converted and went on to pay for that with his life eventually. When historians come up with an explanation, there are a number of criteria they take. Number one is the explanatory scope, the quantity of facts accounted for by the explanation. In other words, if you've got five bedrock facts, your explanation, an explanation that counts for four of them is better than one that counts for just one of them. Explanatory power, the quality of the explanation of the facts. There are some explanations that are better than others. Plausibility, that explanation is implied by the facts better than some other candidate explanation. So in other words, you look at the facts, say, well, let's, let's just see what explanations they imply, and then we'll evaluate the different explanations on how well they follow from the historical bedrock facts. Less ad hoc. They're, they're, they're not something you just make up and throw in a number of assumptions for which there's no evidence. Finally, illumination. Does that explanation that arises out of the historical bedrock facts actually explain some other things in history that you weren't actually looking at initially? And if it does, you have an explanation that not only handles those facts but has greater explanatory power, historically speaking, because it addresses other things. At this point, I would like to uh, refer to you this book by Michael Lacona. And he examines all the explanations that have been put forward, all the major categories. There's about five, six major categories of explanations, and he examines those. And will pick a particular explanation that's the best in that category by a particular scholar. And all of them are analyzed according to the historiographical method. And when that is done, the theory or the explanation that Jesus of Nazareth actually rose from the dead is the only theory that satisfies all five criteria. In other words, if you're simply looking at the facts as from the perspective of an historian, um, it appears that Jesus of Nazareth actually rose from the dead. There are other scholars that have come to the same conclusion. William Craig did his PhD under Wolfhard Pannenberg at the University of Munich and came and has written various publications on that. Um, Pincus Lapid, an Orthodox Jewish scholar, uh, came to the same conclusion as well, although he believes that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah for the Gentiles, not for the Jews. Uh, there's one other fact uh, that more of us probably are aware. Seven week waiting period followed by thousands believing within a few days. Within 30 years, it had exploded throughout the Roman Empire. Nero was burning Christians in Rome. And within 20 years, 22 years, it has spread as far east as India. And there's still an area in India that today has the descendants of those first Christians from the first century. And that, by the way, is a coin, a coin dating back to the first century in India that shows uh, the Apostle Thomas on that coin. That's his face. Bottom line, the most careful, rigorous, and up-to-date historical analysis points to the resurrection of Jesus Nazareth as an historical event that had immediate and massive consequences for the Roman Empire and throughout history. To summarize this second section, there is an historical figure that is highly unique in history. There were ancient prophecies about the Christ or the Messiah that had been made hundreds and even thousands of years before he came. Secondly, there's a good historical case that the physical resurrection from the dead actually occurred. These two extraordinary lines of warrant give us an extraordinary reason to believe that God exists is active in history and in humanity. There is no other individual in history that's purported to have risen from the dead that even survives a preliminary historiographical analysis. Part three, why is this so important to me? In the New Testament, there's a nice definition of God that I like. God is the origin of every good thing and every perfect gift. So you think about that for a second. God is the origin of flawless justice, the origin of beauty, the origin of music and art, the origin of love and honor and power and every good thing. And so if that is the case, there is a problem. And that is that all of us, we've done wrong things. We've at least fallen short of our own conscience from time to time. We've said things or done things that we regretted afterwards and so forth. How much further have we fallen short of the one who is the origin of flawless justice and beauty 
The problem is this, is that the demands of flawless justice and the demands of perfect love must both be fulfilled. Now, interestingly, there was a prophecy made 700 years prior to the time of Christ. It's recorded in the book of Isaiah, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls, that days prior to the time of Christ has that prophecy in it, so we know it actually existed, but it states repeatedly over a period, quite a section within Isaiah, beginning the last part of chapter 52 and all of chapter 53, that an individual would come someday upon whom all the demands of justice for all the evils and atrocities of humanity would be laid on that individual so that he could fully satisfy the demands of perfect justice, even in the sight of the one who is the origin of beauty and justice himself. Jesus actually claimed to be that person. So if that is the case, then God became one of us, that is the creator of the cosmos, this supernatural, timeless, uncaused entity. God became one of us to fully satisfy the demands of flawless justice so that he could fully satisfy the demands of perfect love and honor. And according to Jesus, he was it. He was the one. So um, what does that mean for us? Basically, that's where faith steps in. So the next step is up to each person. Jesus said, know that I'm standing at the door and knocking. That's the door to your soul, to your heart. I'm knocking, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into that person, and we will dine together. Now we can enjoy the friendship of God. One last uh, quote, Jesus said, uh, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live. He's talking about a different kind of life than just mere mortal physical life. He will live even if it dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this?